Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This Kodachrome transparency shows the position of two maxillary central incisors prior to periodontal therapy. According to this patient's history, these teeth have been separating over a period of years. This diastema was corrected after oral physiotherapy and occlusal adjustment by selective grinding. The preoperative study casts show the diastema between the maxillary central incisors the maxillary first premolar and mandibular first molar. The maxillary first molar has extruded into the opposing space. This radiograph shows the preoperative view of the area. There is a defect on the mesial surface of the right central incisor which appears to be of infrabony character. This radiograph shows the donor site for the autogenous bone. The area is just distal to the maxillary right canine where the alveolar process ascends on the distal surface. This is a Hawley bite plane that was used to permit further eruption of the posterior teeth. It was then used to close the diastema between the two maxillary central incisors. The labial arch wire and elastics help bring the maxillary central incisors lingually and mesially. After the diastema was closed, the teeth were immobilized with a stainless steel wire and acrylic extracoronal temporary splint. This splint remains in place during the entire operative procedure and during the healing process following the autogenous bone graft. This film shows the area after tooth movement has been accomplished and the teeth have been stabilized with the wire ligature splint. The Hirschfeld silver point demonstrates that the pocket is truly an infrabony defect. The calibrated point is flush with the gingival margin on the mesial surface of the tooth. It shows that there is a 12 millimeter defect from the gingival margin to the base of the pocket, six millimeters of which are actually infrabony in character. This is where the free osseous tissue autograft will be placed. A topical anesthetic is sprayed on the alveolar mucosa. An anesthetic solution containing one one hundred thousandth epinephrine is infiltrated into the mucolabial fold. The palatal tissues are also anesthetized. The lesion on the mesial side of the maxillary central incisor is explored with a calibrated probe. It is obvious that the defect on the right extends more apically than that on the left. The sulci in adjacent areas measure three to four millimeters in depth. The palatal infrabony pocket on the mesial aspect of the central incisor measures eight millimeters. It is important to note the palatal gingival groove on the maxillary right central incisor this groove probably played a primary role in the etiology of this infrabony pocket. The probe follows the groove into the defect. A Castroveo blade breaker is used to create a fine scalpel from a razor blade. An internal beveled incision is made on the labial aspect. This bevel preserves as much gingiva as possible.
The same type of incision is made on the palatal aspect, following the pattern of the gingival margins and interdental papillae. The internal beveled aspect of the incision helps to remove the inflamed lining of the pocket. Using the number 11 Goldman Fox interproximal knife, the interdental papillae are separated from their labial halves. This instrument is also used on the labial aspect, being certain that the papillae have been separated from their lingual halves. After the area is irrigated, a periosteal elevator is used to reflect a full thickness labial flap. The reflection is extended to include the interdental papilla between the lateral incisor and the canine. This will permit greater access to the lesion. The contour of the labial and proximal bony crests of these anterior teeth follows the physiologic curve except at the site of the lesion. A full thickness reflection is also made on the palatal surface. This exposure is necessary to gain complete access to the bony lesion. The Goldman Fox number four curette is used to remove the inflammatory tissue between the bony wall and the tooth. The realignment of the two central incisors has helped to reduce the width of the infrabony defect. Great care should be taken to remove all tags of inflammatory tissue and thoroughly prepare the root by planing. A number 12 Goldman Fox curette, which is small enough to reach the base of this narrow infrabony pocket, is used. This combination lesion has two bony walls at the base of the pocket and a single proximal wall near the coronal position. It is classified as a combination infrabony defect. An incision is now made over the crest of the saddle between the maxillary canine and the premolar. A full thickness flap is reflected and the bony area is checked to determine the most favorable donor site. A chisel is used to remove the excess bone distal to the canine. This will not only improve the contour at this site, 
but will also provide the required donor tissue of cancellous and cortical bone. The bony autograft is inserted into the lesion on the mesial aspect of the central incisor with a Wiedelstadt chisel. A hand chisel is used to correct the osseous margin distal to the canine. These small chips of bone help to fill the defect on the central incisor. Bone is taken from the donor site and immediately placed in the recipient site. It does not leave the mouth and is not stored in any type of solution. A Cohen Brenman Ron Juret contours the osseous tissue distal to the canine in the saddle area to assure the restoration of physiologic architecture. The lingual and labial flaps are now approximated and secured with individual interproximal sutures. Flaps extend slightly onto the enamel because the tissue shrinkage during healing will cause the gingival margin to recede somewhere close to the cervical lines of the teeth. The suturing is completed and has secured the labial and lingual tissues. No bone is exposed in any area and a surgical dressing can now be applied. Although the tissues could be left uncovered, a dressing helps prevent irritation from food particles that might interfere with the healing process. A bare Sumner dressing is placed over the labial and lingual soft tissues. This dressing does not contain eugenol. The Hawley bite plane is replaced and will help to keep the dressing in position. The patient is advised to retain the bite plane for one week. At the end of this time, the pack is replaced and the sutures are removed. A dressing of the modified Kirkland formula is placed over the Bear Sumner pack. This is a harder dressing and will help to keep the Bear Sumner pack in position. The pack is locked interproximally to prevent displacement. Muscle trimming prevents overextension of the pack with subsequent impingement on the mucosa. The patient is told to use an ice pack on the outside of the upper lip to reduce any ensuing edema. This radiograph was taken immediately after surgery. The autogenous bone can be seen in the improboni defect on the mesial surface of the maxillary right central incisor. One month post-operatively, the tissues appear to be healing satisfactorily. The repair distal to the canine tooth is adequate and minimal sulcular depth is present.
A fixed bridge inserted three months post-operatively stabilizes the anterior segment. The missing teeth are also replaced by this restoration. The lingual casting provides maximum support and aesthetics. It may be necessary, however, to perform a gingivoplasty at this time to improve the contour of the gingival margins and papillae. The mandibular molar has also been replaced. The prosthesis in this mouth was fabricated by Dr. David Boudreau, chairman of the Crown and Bridge Department of the University of Pennsylvania. Again, note the preoperative appearance of the infrabony lesion on the central incisor. As compared with its postoperative appearance. And improved bony contour in this area. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.